All right, good time of day, everyone, and welcome to this new MLI Open meeting. Uh, today, I'm going to present about uh, MLI properties, which is a new concept um, intended to replace inherent attributes. And this presentation is a bit different from most MLI presentation today. I'm not going to talk about any dialect. I'm not even sure I'm going to use the word dialect in the entire presentation, which is highly unusual for an MLI presentation. Uh, feel free to interrupt me if you have any question. I'm going to take it as we go. Um, so this talk is going to be really about some deep internal implementation detail of MLIR. Hopefully it's going to be interesting. It's the first time I'm trying to explain those details, which are pretty complicated. And we may have some follow-ups if you deemed this interesting. All right, let's get going. Uh, let's start with uh, how operation um, class is implemented. Right, and let's take somehow a deep dive there. Um, so the one-on-one, -on -one, I hope everyone here is familiar with uh, the concept of operation. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult to follow what's next. So operation has one or multiple results, has a name, has one or multiple operands, which are values, uh, has a dictionary of attributes, has a type for uh, the operands and the results, and the location and a list of region also, and what's also not shown here. For branches, you have a block successor arguments. If you have a conditional branch, you need to record, you know, branch if the condition is taken or not. Um, so how is it implemented? If you look at the class, if you look at the code base and you look at the operation class, you're gonna see that it inherits from iList node with parents and it has also this other class trailing object. So Clang has a nice feature, um, which is um, this F dump record layout that allows you to get information about the, the content of a class, including the parents. So when you run uh, Clang with those arguments, you can get this output. And what you see is read really the content of the class. And on the left is the offset from the operation pointers and where the members are. And so we're going to see that the first member is here, prev and sentinel. The second member is next. And both of those member came from this first parent class, I list node with parent. It's an intrusive doubly linked list. And so this is the pointer to the previous operation in the block. And this is going to be the pointer to the next operation in the block. And so when you iterate from iteration, one iteration to the next, uh, it's just a, a doubly linked list. Um, the training object class, parent class, has no member. It brings no, it's empty, so no information there. Uh, and then we get to the real member of the class, which are declared inside the MLI operation class. There's the block, the parent block, which may be null, uh, the location, and then there are like some fields, order index, num results, the number of results. So order index is an internal field. Um, it helps to decide if one operation is before the other. If you you can query in O1 whether one operation is is appears before another in a block, uh, since they are stored in a linked list, this is helpful. Um, and then the number of results for the operation, number of successor, number of regions, a boolean, um, the name of the operation, and the dictionary of attributes. And so the entire size of of this class is 64 bytes. Now, something that um, we see here, yeah, that's just what I explained. Um, the big question is where are the lists of operands, uh, regions, um, success or block operands, all of that. Um, the only thing we see here is that we have the number of results, number of successor, number of region. We have a Boolean that tells us, do we have operands? But that's it. And so that's where the trailing object um, inheritance comes in. Uh, and some people may already be familiar with the concept of trailing objects, but I'm going to explain what, what it means. So the concept is that when we allocate an operation, we're going to malloc more memory than the 64 bytes required for the operation. And we're going to do that to pack extra data in the same allocation. So here I have an example where we have an operation with two regions. So this operation has no results, no successor block, and two regions and no parents. 
And so what's going to happen is that after the 64 bytes allocated for the operation in the same memory block, we're going to have the two regions there, just like if they were member of the operation class, but you can think of them as dynamic member. Uh, it's at the time of the creation of the class that we can decide we have more member than than uh, what is statically written in C++. And now the malloc size is 112 bytes. So another example uh, where we have two regions, two successor block operands, and three regular operands, um, but no results. And so now we can see that we have a new operand storage type. So that's a new member of 16 bytes. We have two block operands, 24 bytes each, two regions, and three operands, the regular SSA value operands. And so the malloc size becomes 224 bytes. So what happens when you try to get, I don't think we're going to do successor, we're going to try to get the region. This slide is wrong. Um, what happens when you try to get the, uh, the, first the, the second region? Right. So when you try to get this point, a pointer to this second region here, this slide is correct. Uh, you first reinterpret the this pointer. So this is the operation pointer, offset zero. Um, and then you just increment. So you increment from the size of operation, 64 bytes. That brings you to the operand storage here. Uh, then you increment from the size of operand storage. Then you increment two times the size of block operand. So you get the two from here, from the number of successors. And that gets you the beginning of region. At this point, you are in the region block. You can reinterpret cast to say, I'm pointing to a list of region. And we just offset directly into this pointer. And all this logic here is what is provided by the LLVM trailing objects class. Just inheriting from this class implements this logic for us. You can say, give me the block of region, and it will do all this offset and pointer calculation for us. But this is really how it's implemented. All right, let's look at uh, operand storage because it's a little bit special. We saw that there is this operand storage class at offset 64. Um, but then we have the operands that are at the end. And so there is a reason for that is that this operand storage class that I'm showing here contains a capacity. It tells us if the storage is dynamic. It contains the current number of operands and a pointer to the beginning of the operands. And so the reason for that is it allows us to have dynamic resizing of the operand. When you have an operation, you can add new operands to it or you can remove operands. Uh, but adding operands beyond the initial allocation of the operation class requires extra storage. And so we start with an initial value of three operands. That's how we allocated and created this operation. But if we add new operands, uh, we're going to need to malloc a separate block of four, five more operands and use this instead. And so basically, you can think that the operand storage is operating like small vector. Small vector is this vector that has inline storage pre-allocated statically. And here the static part is at uh, when we create the operation. Uh, and so when we create the operation, we have in this block here, a pointer that points here. Um, all right. Results now. So we've seen everything except the operation results. And operation results are not part of the trailing object. Uh, so there's another trick we're playing here. We allocate them before the operation. So an operation with eight results will look like this. You have the pointer to operation that is here, and all the results lives before the operation. Right. And that's why you cannot add or remove any results, any region or any block successor to an operation, you must instead create a new operation and replace the original operation. Only operands have this uh, viadic uh, list with the small vector style trick. So something you may have noticed is that there's inline op results and out of line op results. And why do we have two types of results here? And this is because we play a trick. You may see the size is larger for the out-of-line up results than for the in-line up results. Um, and the trick we're playing here is that uh, 
uh, let, let's see first, what, what is the results? What it, a results is defining a new SSA value. And an SSA value is basically this. It's a pointer to its use list. It has, it has a list of users and a type. And that's all it is. A value is just a type and a list of users. But it also has this extra argument here, um, this extra member here, which tells you which results it is. And this index allows you to go back to the operation pointer, meaning when you have an op result, you can go back to the owner. So you can go back to the, 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 the operation that defines an SSA value. And for this, we need this, uh, this index. And so you see that this out of line op results as a pointer here, uh, another, the type here, which is another pointer size and the index here. So that's why it's 24 bytes. What we figured is that we can steal some bits from the type. Uh, so we steal some bits from the pointer used for the type. We steal three bits and we're gonna store a kind here. And with three bits, what we can do is we can store the index for the first six results. And that's what that's what we, we do here. We do we do the inline op result class, which is the same as the previous one, except it doesn't have a separate index. Instead, it's it stores the index in the first three in the last uh, three bits of the type. And we can do that because we guarantee that type is well aligned and has always the last three bits to zero. And so the trick that we're performing here is just a way to reduce the amount of memory for most operations. As long as you have less than six, six results, you only, you, know, you only use 16 bytes per result. I see that there's a question. Oh, gasping for hair. Yes. <laughs> um, all right. And so this is the logic when you call get results. If you try get results like one, two, three, four, five, the logic is implemented as 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 uh, presented here. We have the max number of inline results six. Um, so we cast the current operation pointer to inline op results. So we are at the zero here, and we're gonna index backwards into this first array of six inline op results. So we check if we want one of the first six results, we're gonna get into this if we're gonna index back. Uh, by just offsetting the pointer. And then we're going to return the, the results we found. Otherwise, we have to offset first into um, here, offset minus 120, which is going to be computed, uh, uh, I think, here. Yes. We adjust the index. And then we offset into the, the we offset backward from here into the arrays of out of line up results. All right. So this is the yeah, negative offset from the operation pointer. And that's the implementation of operation class. And I'm just going to pause here and see if anyone wants to ask a question about it, if it was clear enough before I move forward. Nothing. So hopefully I didn't lose anyone in the middle and it was uh, easy enough to follow uh, because we're going to get to attributes now. And attributes is an interesting concept. So attributes, and this is like the all the blurbs from the long graph. You don't need to read it all. What's important is that we have an attribute dictionary attached to an operation. Meaning when we say we have a dictionary of attribute attached to an operation, it's itself an attribute. The only thing we have attached to an operation is one pointer to the dictionary attributes. In this dictionary, we have two kinds of attributes. Inherent attributes, the one that are defined by the operation. Um, and an example is the predicate of the arithmetic compare, integer comparison operation. And we have discardable attributes. Discardable attributes are all the others, the ones that are not part of the operation semantic. They are supposed to be prefixed with a dialect, by the way. We're not verifying this currently, but we probably should. Um, so I have some example. So this is the arithmetic um, operation. Uh, on the top, you have here the ODS definition, uh, where the arguments are here. You have uh, the predicate, which is the attributes, and then you have the two regular SSA 
um, operand. And in the textual form, that looks like this, the SLT here, um, uh, signed lower than is the, is the predicate for the, the operation. Uh, when you print generically, uh, you remove the pretty printer. It appears like that. It's just an integer attribute. That's how it's stored internally. Um, in C++, it's going to be converted to a, to an enum, enum value. So the SLT here is the enum value for integer 2. Uh, and there, I have a, another example. Uh, when you take a module and you can add some attributes on a module, for example, GPU.container module or spearv.targetenv, and those are discardable attributes. They are not defined by the semantic of the module. They are added by some use cases, by your own compiler pipeline, by, and they would be interpreted as such. But they are not guaranteed to be preserved by generic passes. So they are only valid in the context of your own pipeline and uh, what, what you can control. Um, all right, any question about attributes before I get into implementation of attributes? Oh, all right, I'm going to continue then. Um, so let's look at the implementation of attributes. This is a regular example you may find in code, right? You get a vector of offsets. So it's just a small vector of integer value. And you want to make it an attribute. So you call dense i64 array attributes, colon, colon, get, provide the context and the values. And what you get out of it is, uh, this is the textual um, IR, you get an array of i64 and the values. So how does it work? What happens when you do this, this get? Well, let's first see what is the return value. What what do we get out of it? We get this class, which uh, so dense i64 array attribute is uh, an implementation of a template. It's 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 using a base class dense array attributes and it's instantiating it for in 64t here. But the only everything is zero zero no member no member no member no member and this is the last uh, line and we have size eight so we have one member which is a pointer to the implementation type. So when you get an attribute, which is a, a value-based class, the only thing it does, it wraps a pointer. So you can treat it as a pointer, even though it's a value-based class. All right, so when you copy an attribute, you just copy a pointer, basically. So how do we get this pointer? Because the only thing this get does is populating this pointer. So let's see what, a, what, what it points to first. And what it points to is provided in the template here. It's pointing to this dense array attribute storage. So what is a dense array attribute storage? Well, now we can see the, the body. The body is here, really, the three members. It has a element type. So in this case, it's going to be a I64. It has a size, the number of elements, and it has read a, 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 a char pointers, but it's the raw data to the in, in 64 um, array of data here. Um, and so every attribute is a pointer to the storage, and the storage is what you would expect, the content of the data uh, modeling these attributes. And that's what we call a storage, an attribute storage. And there are things that are something interesting here. We have a key type. And uh, almost all storage attributes will have that. And it's just a tuple of, usually it's just a tuple of the members. And we use this for hashing and I'm gonna get into some detail about that. All right, so attributes. Um, attributes, to get them, we get them from the context. That's where they are stored. So when we look at the context implementation, you may find that we have two maps. We have a dense map, of type ID to abstract attributes pointer. And this is just the abstract information about an attribute class. For example, the interfaces that are implemented by this attribute or how to print this attribute. There is a callback to pretty print the attribute, those kind of thing. Um, and then there is this class storage uniker, attribute uniker, which is the storage for every attribute created ever by this context. So let's look at what is the storage uniker. 
And here's the implementation. And basically there is one map. Um, it's a bit more complex, but I simplified it for, uh, it's enough to understand what's happening here. There's one map of type ID to parametric storage Uniker. Uh, so what is type ID, by the way, if you're not familiar with MLIR, type ID is uh, um, a class that allows you to get a unique ID for, for any type. You can get an ID for what is a string attribute. You can get an ID for the type void. You can get an ID for the type like int. Uh, or for MLR context, and that allows you to map a type to some data. And in this map, we can then, you know, the keys are going to be string attribute, integer attribute, whatever your attribute is, and it will map to a parametric storage uniker. And we're going to see what the implementation of this is next. Because this is what store the content of our attributes. So here's the implementation of the parametric storage uniker. It contains a um, dense set of instances. And so the dense set, the first um, template argument here is the content. So this is what is going to be in the set, hashed storage. And the second template parameter is just how to, how to hash uh, the value and how to query the, the set. But this is really what's, what's in the set is hash storage. And we have an allocator. And I'm showing you at the bottom what's the allocator. It's just a helper class wrapping around a bump pointer allocator. So a bump pointer allocator, if you don't know what it is, it's it's a, just a, a, a kind of allocator where you just pile on more memory by bumping the pointer, basically. And you can never free individual elements of the, of the allocator. Uh, you have to release the entire memory at the same time, some sort of a pool. Um, all right, let's see. Um, let's see what's next. OK, so next is the recap, because I went through a lot of hierarchy, and I figured it would be hard to follow or to to put a mental model. And I'm, I'm more visual, so I try to provide you also with a visual view of it. So the big blue box is the MLR context. It contains a storage uniker. Inside the storage uniker, there is this dense map that maps type ID to parametric storage uniker. So those are the keys of this map, string attribute, integer attribute, any kind of attribute. And each of the attribute class will have its own storage uniker. Inside this storage uniker, we have first a dense set of instances. And so those are really the, the, the attributes, basically. And the hash storage is uh, a pair of a hash and a pointer to the storage. So here you have the first entry in the set. What it contains is a hash of the storage and a pointer to somewhere in the allocator. And here are the, the raw data contained inside the bump pointer allocator. And so the first storage will point here. The second storage will point here, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all all there is to store attributes in the context. Um, so what happens to go back to our example when we want to do dense i64 array attribute get, what do we do? Well, we first get the context. We go through the attribute uniker. We have to find the type ID for this dense i64 array attribute. We query this dense map. We find the entry for dense array attributes. We find the parametric storage uniker for it. And now we have to find whether the attributes that we want to build already exists because they will be created uniquely. So what we do, we create this tuple with the type in 64, the array ref in 64, basically the key that we showed earlier. And we're going to hash this and try to find an entry in this dense set. If we find an entry, we're going to use the tuple to compare to the storage. And if we have a match, we can just return this pointer immediately. If we don't have a match, we have to create a new one. And we're going to use this key to build the new entry. So to build the new entry, we add a new entry in the dense set. And the pointer will point to this newly allocated um, dense array attribute storage. So the instance of the attribute, the pointer we return in the final attribute is going to be here. What we're going to have to do before 
is also to copy this offset vector. So basically the small vector you got there will be copied into this bump pointer locator in the context. And so all this memory will be living in the context here. Um, okay, so that's a simplified view of the world because something that uh, happens in reality is that the API to get attribute is thread safe. And I didn't, I skipped all the thread safety that involves, you know, uh, adding things into a map. It's also very much optimized for multi-threading access, knowing that most of the time an attribute will be accessed, uh, will be created once, but then accessed multiple times. So we have per thread caching. So you can hash and query per thread. Uh, the storage is not actually in a single uh, parametric storage, but it's sharded. Um, so we split. We, we take the, the hash and we divide by the number of shards we want so that we, we, we load balance between different shards. And we do this so that we take, we have less lock contention when multiple thread wants to create attributes. Um, it would just be too complex to fit on the slide. So I provided you with, with this, but that's enough to create a mental model about how attributes are accessed and created, I think. So the recap for attributes is that those are immutable objects. Um, they get created and they can never be mutated. Uh, it's a great get or create access pattern. So you get to retrieve a unique pointer per MLIR context. The data will be in the MLIR context. You have um, some content-based hashing. You saw this tuple that is created. And so we do this um, hashing and comparison on every get of an attribute that you may do. And the memory will leak in the context, meaning because it's a bump pointer locator, if you ever created an attribute once, it will live in the context forever for the duration of, of, of until this context is destroyed, basically. You cannot release the memory. Uh, some of the advantages, it's a very simple ownership model because the MLR context owns the data. An attribute will live as long as the context is alive. And all the memory will be released in one shot when we tear down the MLR context. Another advantage is that you can compare two attributes with a simple pointer comparison. After you did all the work of hashing and comparing to get the attribute, you have a pointer that is unique. And so the equality between two attributes is just a pointer comparison. Um, all right. And uh, because it's a recap, I'm going to pause again and ask if anyone has a question. On on this whole process, or if I should go back and revisit one of the slides. No one, we're good. So hopefully again, I didn't lose everyone in this process. It's pretty involved. I hope I managed to make it, you know, understandable. Is someone trying to speak? Yeah, I have a very quick question just to make sure I, I understand correctly. So storage itself is unique. So um, we have two different operations with the same dense attribute, uh, same content, two different operations, two different attributes, but same content. Will they still uh, have the same pointer? Like the storage itself is unique, is that correct? Yes. So that means if you, if you call multiple times dense i64 array attribute get with the same sequence of integer, you get the same pointer back. Awesome, cool. Thank you. What we're, what we're hashing here is going to be the, the sequence of integer that is passed here so that we copy it once in the storage and we will get always the same pointer. So okay, yes, so if two, if two operations totally unrelated, they both have a dense i64 array attribute with one, two, three, four, five, they have the, a pointer to the same instance always. Great. So we never actually like um, do equality in content which, because we just hash it, right? Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. You do the equality, but only during the get, right? When you create it. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Anyone else? Before I move forward. All right. Let's go. We can we can take more questions at the end as well. Okay, so now we understand how operation is modeled. We understand how attribute are created, stored, accessed. 
Um, so we have a good idea of this mental model. Let's look at the accessors that exist on, on operation. Uh, so at first you have those get operand, set operand, erase operand, get num results, get results, get region. So those are all direct member access and mutation. We saw the layout of uh, an operation. We saw that those are members uh, like regular C++ member, and you have some offset calculation that is most of the time in lines, but other than that, you get a direct pointer to a member in the same allocation block, and you can change it. You can change the type of a result. You can change the number of results, but you can change the type of a result. You can change an operand in place. You can um, access region and mutate them. Then you have... Uh, get attribute dictionary and set attribute, which checks the dictionary. And that's accessing the dictionary member. There is one member on the operation class, which is a dictionary attribute. It's one attribute. And we can directly access it and mutate it. But it's not what happens most of the time. It's not the most commonly used API. Instead, uh, most of the API used will be get attribute with a name. You want one specific attribute in this dictionary or set attribute by name, you know, give the key and you get, you provide a new value or remove an attribute from the dictionary. And so those APIs are commonly used, but in practice, they are hiding a complex and pretty inefficient behavior. And I'm going to explain why, but you may have an idea that you can infer from the previous section. So this is the member we are looking at, at the very last member of, of the operation class, there is the dictionary attribute, which is itself an attribute, right? So conceptually, a dictionary attribute is a map. It maps a string to an attribute value. In reality, what it's, how it's implemented, it's an array of a pair of string attributes and any attribute. So the pair represents the key value and it's just a sorted array, sorted by the key. And so when you want to query something, you can imagine that you can just do a bisection to find the right, the right place. And you note that the keys are also attribute themselves. And so this is really, really the implementation of a dictionary attribute. Now, think about that this is also immutable and that this is stored in the context. And you can imagine, oh, any mutation of this dictionary can be very costly. So let's look at an example here. Um, this is the implementation of the set adder method on the operation class. And here is what it does. It will first create a named attribute list, which is really a vector of pair of string attributes and attributes. It will copy the dictionary into this vector. Then we're going to mutate the vector in place, really by doing a bisection by finding the right place to insert the new value, by shifting everything, and by keeping this an sorted vector of pair. And then when we're done with this, we can get a new dictionary. So we're going to go to the context, hash this vector, and get a new dictionary for that. So let's look at some real world example. So I'm going back to the comparison um, operation. Uh, which has one attribute, the predicate here. Um, so I already showed you this, just a reminder. So on this um, operation, if you wanted to swap operands using the ODS generated accessors, you have the comparison operation here. You can get the, the left-hand side operands of the comparison, the right-hand side here, and you can directly assign the right-hand side to the left, etc. So those are the direct member access. Like any C++, you just access the member and you can mutate it in place. Now, what if you want to do something that involves the predicate? For example, the fold method for this um, comparison will always try to push the constants to the right of the comparison. And so this is code that I adapted from, from MLIR, but it really exists inside MLIR. Um, we're going to check that we have a constant on the left-hand side and not the right-hand side. Uh, we get the predicate. So here we already have a dictionary lookup. We have to do a bisection to find in this array the right predicate and return it. 
then we're going to compute the reverse predicate because if we swap the operand, we have to also change the predicate, swap it. And so we, 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 we're going to do the set predicate of this new pred computed predicate. And that's what we're going to look at. What happens when we call this ODS method? So it's just ODS gives you an, an accessor, get predicate and set predicate. We're going to look in detail what happens when we do that. So this get or create here. So this set predicate involves creating a new dictionary in the context. In the context. All right. So just a recap on the operation mutability before I, I dig really into into this example. Um, swapping, adding, removing operands. It's like the cost is or the, the implementation is very close to usual C plus plus direct member access. Adding or modifying attributes complex and costly. Every single modification of an attribute will copy the dictionary, edit a vector in place, hash everything, and copy and leak the memory into the context. And so if you have sequence of mutation, you're going to even leak all the intermediate step into the, into the context. So that's a lot of traffic in this context map and uniquing and hashing. So here is an example of um, an op where we want to set three different attributes. So we're going to set the first attribute to the value 42, the second attribute to the value 43, the third attribute to the value 44. So when we execute the first line set attribute here, we have to first find the parametric storage unique for the integer attributes uh, that, we, that we create here. We have to hash the 42, copy it into the context. If we don't find it, allocate you know, space, copy the integer there. Then we have to allocate the integer attributes, uh, map the pointers, insert it in the set, and return it. Then we create a new dictionary attribute. So we add a new entry in this vector for attribute one and, and this value. And we have to find the parametric storage unique in the context for dictionary attribute. We have to hash this vector of pair, key value pair. Um, and we copy this new dictionary into the context. And then we move on to the next line and we do this three times. Um, and something I don't even show here is that the keys are also attributes. So we also need to do the same thing for the key. That's steps that are missing here. When you use a string here, we have first to hash the string, look up if it already exists in the context. Otherwise we copy the string into the string attribute storage um, and return a unique pointer to it. And so we're going to repeat all of that three times. The, what, it, what does it look like? Um, uh, we're going to have, uh, in the end, a pointer. I think this example is, is not totally right. I'm going to skip the example and move on. Um, I'm showing here another view of this example. Um, I think it's not correct either totally, but let me try this. Oh, yeah, OK. So this is what happens. We first get the integer attribute. So we go to the integer attribute parametric storage unique. -er. We're going to get back a pointer to this uh, integer attribute. As we saw, it's unique for this value. We do the same thing for the key, but this time in the string attribute parametric storage unique. -er. And when we get this, we assemble a vector that we hash and that we insert in the dictionary attribute parameter parametric storage unique. -er. And then we move on to attribute two, and we do the same thing. This time, it's the value 43 that is created and copied. Then we do the same for the key, attribute two. And then we create a new dictionary attribute, which has the first entry, right? The same as here, pointer two points to 42, pointer, uh, uh, pointer two points to attribute one, pointer one points to the value 42. Second entry, pointer three points to attribute two, pointer four points to um, the integer attributes. And then when we want to do the third attribute, it's the same logic. We first create the integer. We hash the key, create the, the string stored in the context, and we create a new dictionary. And all the intermediate values, those dictionary here, are created and will live in the context forever. All right, and I'm going to pause here because that's the end of the attribute section. Um, River at the commands that we also need to hash the types. Yes, I skipped this for simplicity, but um, let me go back uh, because it's interesting to also understand that 
what we the logic we the logic I gave for for um for uh attributes is the same for types. Types and attributes are using exactly the same mechanism. If you create a types, you go through the exact same logic as attributes. Actually, this storage unique class is used for types as well. And we store types in exactly the same way. So what happens, I think, here is that if you don't have, already have a pointer to a type, but you want to create a type, you have to do to do this as well here. All right. Uh, thanks, River, for the comments. Uh, Ahmed has another question. The question is like whether set other calls in different threads get serialized for thread safety because they all mutate the MLI context. Right, so if you have multiple threads and each of them are doing on different operation, of course, but a set attribute or an attribute get. Um, so first, operation itself, this API is not thread safe. You cannot call set attribute on the same operation from multiple threads. And that's why multiple threads in MLIR can process, for example, different functions, but they cannot process the same function because you cannot mutate operation directly by multiple threads. The context is thread safe. So for example, this call here is thread safe. And if multiple threads are calling at the same time, integer adder get, either with the same value or not, the context is thread safe. And that's what I was describing a bit earlier, where, where we have multiple shards to avoid contention. There will be a bunch of locks that will be taken, but uh, it's all sharded to avoid collision and reduce the, the contention on those locks in the context. The next question is, uh, would it be possible to garbage code and use attributes if we know that there are not existing pointers except for module? that someone could depend on, conceptually similar to serializing and deserializing the module. Um, and I'm gonna first like just take this opportunity to mention the last uh, sentence, serializing and deserializing the module. One way to garbage collect memory in the context would be to serialize the module to bit code, trash the context, create a new context and deserialize the module. That way, the only thing existing in the context are the entities that this module contains. There's no garbage collection right now. Um, it's um, it's a bit complex because you saw that a bump pointer allocator, which doesn't have slab or any any complex allocation scheme. If everything was malloced instead of using a bump pointer allocator, we could think about it. The difficulty would be that right now nothing is ref counted, for example. And we don't have a way to know whether an attribute refers to another attribute. Um, and so, I, as I mentioned earlier, the problem is the ownership model. That said, you could implement already today your own attributes that malloc itself, bypassing the bump pointer allocator. You, you don't have to store in the bump pointer allocator. You can, you can walk around that. And you could implement your own garbage collection by saying at one point you have, you have um, a pass that will walk the IR, collect pointers to all attributes, and then you know garbage collect your own attributes. That would be technically possible with some caveats. Um, there are some discussion on the chat also about uh, lock contention, and River mentions that despite what I said about how optimized um, our access are in terms of sharding and and unlocking, we still hit a lot of contentions. Um, and I don't see any other question for me right now. So I think I'm going to move on. Oh, I, I have a question. I also wrote in the chat, like, what is the performance impact? Um, what is the performance impact of what? Of contention? Oh, no, just because you presented any issues, right? So I'm just I'm just wondering, like in the worst case, what is what was the the performance impact? Have like it's it's really hard to say because it's gonna let me go back. No, it's not here. Because we always want to optimize the 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 you know the worst yes. case, right? So I I presume this is a huge issues for performance. 
Yeah, so it all depends. So as you saw, it's it's uh, this process is fairly complex. It involves a lot of hash map. Now the performance impact will depend, is heavily dependent on your access pattern. Meaning, are you accessing a lot of attributes? It depends how you're using the APIs. For example, I didn't show it on the slides, but so first you have to go through all this. This The performance of this depends on the number of threads trying to do it at the same time or the same kind of attributes. So already here, it's going to depend on how threaded your application is, how, and, and, and it's hard to have a generic you know, workload that I can compare against. Uh, the next thing is that it depends how you write code. For example, ODS encourages bad practices. I'm just trying to find the right slide. Yes, this one. ODS generates this kind of accessors, which mutates the dictionary. Uh, all these complex processes hidden, and that encourages to to do a lot of that. But in practice, when you have something like this, you could do it much more efficiently. Instead of doing set attribute, set attribute, set attribute, you could get a vector, build yourself the vector of key value pair, and create the dictionary attribute once. The problem is that there are not many people doing it. It's just cumbersome to write the boilerplate to micro optimize this. Um, so it's hard to say. It's very, very uh, situation dependent. I mean, in a lot of cases, the performance is not actually that big of a deal, realistically. But mm -hmm. what happens is that you just have workloads that hit the edge cases of, oh, I'm doing something correctly. So now you either balloon compile time because you're doing a bunch of silly things that the API lets you do easily, or you balloon your memory because everything's immutable. And all of a sudden you have like five gigs because you were touching attributes in a way that you probably shouldn't have. So at least in my experience, it's mostly about cutting down the edge cases. The thing about lock contention is probably the one that I see the most frequently though, <laughs> just because <laughs> it's really dependent on what you're doing realistically. And LLVM doesn't have a lockless hash map that we can use. So we're kind of fighting locks all the time. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the, uh, all these presented a uh, lot, they're like sound to me. I'm just worried about we're optimizing on some really, you know, um, like minor uh, performance paths. But I as mean, you say, uh, some sometimes we'll hit like the edge, case, uh, edge cases and it will be pretty terrible. So I, I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, ODS does some optimizations for stuff that help a little bit, but I, these kinds of things I kind of see are, are similar in some cases to when you would use like small ver vector versus std vector. Like it usually doesn't show up on your profile, but it's there. It's, yeah. it's always there, especially with attribute accessors and stuff. It's just, it's, it's sometimes hard to like see immediately where it is on the profile unless you know exactly what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. I'm and all the sharding that was done was done in the past in response to profiling that we were seeing. And we were seeing, again, that was like two years ago. So I don't remember the numbers. River probably doesn't remember numbers either, I guess. But there have been a lot of work going into caching a lot of things because we were seeing this on profiles everywhere. So we know from experience that, that this showed up two years ago. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, so I think that's it. Well, I don't have much time. I'm going to pitch now properties. So properties is a, a, a new way of, of approaching this um, and approaching what attributes are. So the main goal is to separate. So I have a few goals that I approached in this project. Uh, separate the inherent and discardable attributes. So inherent attributes are really what is described in ODS, the properties of your operation, hence the name properties. Not very good with naming. Um, those are separate concepts, and I, I believe they deserve separate namespaces. Another solution would be to have two dictionary attributes on the operation to separate those concepts. Another motivation is to align the inherent attribute, like the pre like the predicate of the comparison, with other operation members, like the operands. There's no reason that those are on a totally different uh, scale in terms of how we access and manipulate them. 
so I'm trying to get the mutability of this in these inherent attributes to be free, no complex hashing, no locking, nothing, direct access. And I'm also trying to solve the lifetime of the data. I'm trying to give the ability to associate the lifetime of the data to the lifetime of the operation itself. And that's what I'm trying to do with properties. Uh, all right, so how does it work? Um, so we saw the current layout, we have an operation, right? And we just have the dictionary attribute here, uh, which will contain the predicate plus the discalable attribute. Instead, I'm adding a new properties entries in ODS that can describe properties. So we can move the predicate into properties. When we do that, we have a new allocation here that can store the predicate directly as a member of the class. Uh, and now the offset is, you know, has to be computed. So what is going to be the offset? Because we don't know what are the properties beforehand. Um, and so the implementation is fairly simple, actually. The only thing that this does is roughly equivalent to creating an extra class declaration where we create an inner class called properties that contains a predicate. Um, and there is a new accessor on the operation that allows you to get the properties. And that's almost all there is. Um, so we're going to allocate here size of Arith, the class, right? The class name, properties, if it exists. So if this class exists, we just allocate storage for it directly in the operation allocation. Um, and then we can access it and all ODS accessors can be generated so that you can access and mutate it in place. Um, so here's an example with the three attributes we had before, right? The exact same example and adjusted to see what if it was using uh, properties. And so if this was using properties, we would have this class existing on the up, right? Three integers and some accessors, uh, getter setters. And what we would do when we implement the code, we would get properties, up dot properties. We get a mutable reference to the operation properties and we can do set attribute, we can directly access it. And all of this is like direct C++ mutation. And in all this process, the only thing we do here is an offset computation and we get a direct mutable pointer. Uh, the layout in memory would look like this, right? We have the operation class and after uh, the end of, of, of the class, the operand storage, you get these properties in this new struct, exactly the one that is defined here. And you have those attributes exactly as member, plus some padding here to align. And then you have the operands of, of, of the operation. And so properties, you can see it as the ability to add any kind of C++ data member to an operation, making it look like more like a regular class. That's a, a, a brand new extensibility mechanism. And it has some interesting um, things that you can do. So here is a fancier example. You can create properties that would contain an integer, but also a vector, right? A real stud vector, a mutable one. Uh, you can have shared pointers. Um, so now you can have the kind of garbage collection we were talking about before with some caveats, right? Um, we should only have shared pointer to const object um, because because when you clone operation, you don't want to have two operation pointing to a, the same mutable uh, storage. But uh, but yeah, this is this is already a step up from from attributes, and from there you can get the properties. You can push back to the vector, so so it's resizable, and it's the cost of a stat vector. It's no longer going through hashing, duplicating the content, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this is an example where we would pull allocate for for um, reference counting. So my dialect could have a pool of string here, uh, and I would be able to, you know, content hash just like string attribute, but I would get a ref counted string, so that this string would be deallocated when the last operation using it stop using it. Um, And the last bits on properties that requires some boilerplate because there are still things we need to do with operation that we got for free with attribute that we won't get for free anymore. We need to be able to hash the property and that's useful for CSE operation equivalence. We need to hash an operation and to hash the content of an operation. 
uh, before we were relying on attributes being hashed in the context. Now we need to hash on demand. To be able to keep the ability to print uh, generically, um, we enforce that we can always convert the property structure to an attribute. And we can also always set the property from an attribute. And that's pretty useful for generic printing. Uh, but most of this, if you're using table gen, all of those are auto-generated. All right, wrapping up, there are some drawbacks. Um, the memory footprint of operation will increase. The operation allocation gets a bit larger, but we don't leak those allocation uh, in the context anymore. Uh, properties can store a dictionary attribute, meaning if the only member you put in a property is a dictionary attribute, you end back to the existing situation that we have today. So properties doesn't lock you into a specific model. You can still get the almost same behavior as you have today. If, if this is suitable, but you can mix and match. Um, checking that two operations have the same properties require to compare the properties, calling the comparison operator. So there is some trade-off here. Uh, there is some extra runtime cost. When we create an operation, we have to call the constructor. Uh, when we clone an operation, we have to call the assignment operator, copy the property instead of copying a pointer. When we delete an operation, we have to call the destructor. So hopefully it doesn't do too much work there. But in the case of the shell pointer, it has to you know, decrement the ref count when we delete an operation. And we have to hash properties if we want to hash the operation themselves. Things that I haven't looked at is the PDL and DRR integration, mostly because I built a proof of concept. I haven't looked at the build method generated by ODS, but that can be adjusted. Uh, I haven't looked at bindings, auto-generation for C or Python, but nothing we cannot solve there. And the two path forwards also, because it was discussed uh, before, was we can have a separate property that allows operation to opt in what they want in properties and keep the existing inherent attribute mechanism alive. Or we can just say, let's not use a separate field for properties. And let's say that all attributes and properties defined in the argument list will be stored in properties. Um, and to land this, we can add a switch at the dialect level so that there is an opt-in per dialect and, and we can have gradual adoption of this. And if we were doing this, for example, defining arguments with an attribute and a property would create this structure, a structure with an attribute and an integer, exactly as we expect in C++. And I think that's the last slide. Right on time or slightly over. So we won't have time for too many questions. Um, I see that there's one in the chat. Do you have any end-to-end -end slowdown number of using property versus attribute? No, I don't. I don't because the change is not fully backward compatible. Um, so I thought about migrating some dialects and try to use something like Erie and, and try to, to measure compile time and memory consumption. It's a lot of work because you have to update the code itself. Uh, what is the disadvantage of option two? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure there is one. I think I think the, the option two is fairly reasonable as well. Um, option two was suggested to me by River. You know, I went with option one for simplicity when I implemented it. That's the patch that is up is option one. River suggested option two. I, I think it's good. I just thought I would present both. How the context is handled because there was no reference to context in the property. Yes, the context is not involved at all. So if you don't store an, here, the integer attribute, if you want to set it, you have to get it first. So you, will, you have to go to the context to get it. But if you don't use any attribute in the properties, the context is never involved. Those are pure C++ member. When we had a stud vector in the properties, it's just like if you had a stud vector to a C++ class. And the lifetime is the one of the operation is no longer tied to the context. The, you don't even touch the context, not involved. All right, if there are no more questions. I'm gonna speak because you can't see my hand raised, Betty. Jesus. Yes. Um, no, I think this is really good. Uh, the paths here that to land, obviously I'm in favor of number two because I don't, having another field seems weird. Uh, but something that's not listed here is that personally, I would like to see 
properties replace the dictionary on on operations as a first step and just inline all of the attributes as fields to the property struct because that just seems like a fast way to start building the infrastructure without having to mess around with all of the other things that come with storing an int 64t as opposed to an integer adder etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, so that's one 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 comment uh, aside from that though uh, something also not mentioned is the bytecode format is that going to use the git as attribute to to do the storing there for that yeah, that's that's an excellent uh, remark. I didn't talk about the bit code, uh, byte code. Sorry, for the byte code, we can um, we can use by default this uh, uh, get as attributes and store it that way. But we likely want to have a uh, an interface or a method that you know every property can can have a better storage, and I think ODS can generate this. N natively, right? And in 64 can be stored directly, uh, you know, in uh, in Viadic, um, uh storage, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, the other th more of comment was the only real downside to to splitting out the inherent attributes that we talked about in the past is the explosion in memory because you're no longer like effectively reducing two operations that have the same attribute dictionary. For example, two comparisons that are identical would have the same attribute dictionary. Have you seen any like explosions in memory because of that? Because of the other concern that we really had before. I think explosion in memory can happen for, for larger attributes. Most attributes are pretty small. Like with like if you think about the comparison, for example, it's less than it's like a few a few bits uh, technically. Um, so for having memory explosion, you need really large constant or or things that would take more than than on the order of of a few tens of bytes. Um, so again, or a bunch of survey, or a bunch of operations which have the exact same properties or attributes. Yes, but yeah. if you talk you take a bunch of operations that have all the same predicate for the comparison, for example, it still won't explode the memory, right? But if they have a lot of attributes, it will. Yeah, yeah, just a predicate would be, I mean, a predicate is less than a word, right? It would be like predicate plus some other stuff. Um, but no, I think, back to the thing earlier, I think for me, the way to land this first would be just removing the attribute dictionary, because then you also solve all the accessor problems first. Because then they get replaced with no attribute lookup. You saw them as you saw this, but with the property here, and we would have can like right now the IC would other one right, but without the without the ability to do that. Yes, sir. I think my internet cut out, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> to the. The struct properties will just be a bunch of attribute fields there. Yes. So yes. before allowing the N64T and yes. other native types. Right. Right. Yeah, sure. Other than that, I'm I'm on board with this. I mean we talked about this before. So uh, there was a question on the chat I'm gonna answer now uh, from Marcus. Is there anything intrinsic about how printing and passing works that requires property to be converted to attributes? There's no requirements to convert them to pro to attributes, um, and actually, if you don't want to, like, I didn't show it, but you also have callbacks to customize the printing, um, so you can customize the printing of a property. And by default, ODS will print an int as an int. So if you define your property with ODS, you will not use the generic. Um, yeah, you'll print an integer as an integer. You'll print things. Um, Already, but if you use a a complex C plus plus struct of your own, we don't know how to print it. If either you provide us with a printer and parser, or um, we convert to an attribute, which you know uh, comes necessarily with printer and parser. So it's not different than attributes actually. If you create your own attribute, you also have to create printer and parsers. All right, and we are very much over time. Uh, so I think it's a good time to probably stop here. 
uh, we can continue the discussion on this course if you want to know anything or if you have any comments on this proposal. Um, and let me know also how was the deep dive. Uh, we can have other deep dives on other areas of, of MLIR if you're interested uh, to do some implementation walkthrough and this kind of thing. Thanks everyone Thanks, for having And see you next time.